All right. <laughs> so, um, welcome back, or welcome to class, depending upon your attendance pattern up till now. Um, thank you for, for coming. I'm sorry that I don't have a video for, for you to watch. You get to make that video be available for future years. Um, I uh, have all your tests graded. You should have seen that in the grade book up here. I'm not handing that back because there still are outstanding tests due to quarantine and trying to get that taken care of. So as soon as I can get the final test taken, um, I'll hand those out hopefully Monday. That will be available for you to um, have a look at. So, um, because of that, I'll, I'll wait to talk about the specific questions for, for the exam um, and be able to talk about that more thoroughly in um, over the next week. So, instead, what I'd like to do is uh, I'd like to talk about um, using the uh, integer uh, programming strategies that we've been talking about in Chapter 7 for some very specific purposes. And then uh, using that, we're going to start developing a problem together in class, and then I'll stop after we've kind of laid out the general solution strategy for that. And that will be one of the assigned problems that is due for uh, Monday. So let's, uh, let's start with uh, these different solution strategies. Um, in, in all these cases here, for, I'm going to be using specifically binary variables. I'm going to be using binary variables subscripted like this, uh, sub i, that just means that the i binary var variable. Um, so you might have, if you think about your final project, uh, this might be for the congressional district, whether um, county I is in congressional district 1 or, or not, whether um, county I is in congressional district 3 or not, right? you've got a bunch of these types of, of binary variables. And if you combine your binary variables in, in some ways, you can get certain outcomes that, that you, you want from them. Um, so we're going to talk about four specific types of outcomes, or types of constraints that we want to build. The first one is titled K out of N. The idea here is that we want to uh, say that rather than having everything we want to have a subset of everything. Uh, so, <clears throat> if you think about um, when, when I was on the board for uh, the previous church I was at, we made sure that no one person could sign a check, but that you had to have at least two people sign a check so that there was a check and balance about the spending that took place in, in the funding for, for the church, right? In that case, uh, K here was two, at least two out of the people who were listed as signature, signatories on that check had to be able to agree to that. You might have something a little bit more meaningful that says at least three out of five of the people on the board of directors approve of this a major hiring or a purchase or merger or whatever the case is before we bring it to the, the full stockholders for a, approval. So this is the, the type of thing that we're going to try to do here. And the, the way that we do this is quite simple. We're just going to sum up all of our binary variables that we have. Um, anyone uh, have an idea what we want to be true with that sum? These are binary variables. What are the possible values that they could have. Zero, one. And if we want to have um, K, this is, if we want to have K 
k of m be a, a proof of it, what do we want their sum to be? We want it to be equal to k. Right? This is exactly k out of those n signers. Oftentimes, our wording is not exactly. Oftentimes, we will do at least or at most. How would we modify this equation to accommodate at least? Which one? Which relational? Greater than equal. We need to have at least that many. We could certainly have more. Right? And at most is less than or equal. Right? So they're the same type of uh, solution. So all we do is we add up all our binary variables and we make sure that it equals or exceeds or bumps up against whatever this barrier is. Okay? So that's the uh, first type of constraint. <clears throat> Our second type of constraint, I want to do this in the right order, um, is what we're going to call J conditional on I. Alright? So what I mean by this is that um, I'm only going to allow the, the constraint X of J to be true only if x of i is also true. Okay? If x of i is false, that must require x of j to be false. Okay? But the other direction is unspecified. I don't care what the value of x of j is. x of i can be whatever it needs to be. Okay? So, um, in university, we, like, we call this like a prerequisite. Right? You can't take this class until you've first taken that class. Alright. Before I just tell you the answer, let's see if you guys can um, propose how you might build an equation that enforces this constraint. What's that? Uh, that would be the mathematical, but, but we want an equation. Right? Any ideas? Yeah. Could you multiply by some, could you multiply i by some constant? x of i times some constant equals x of j. What would that constant be? Um, Let's think of what the values of x of i are. x of i can only be 1 or 0. So if x of i is 0, it doesn't matter what our constant is, right? x of j will have to equal 0. But if x of i is 1, then it will be this constant, right? So that will force x of j to be that constant. Right? So this is not conditional because this would force j to be true. Well, this would force j to be true if i was true, right? So, and the constant just kind of doesn't matter. Right? So that's a good try, but it doesn't quite work like we want. Any other ideas? If I want to, I can rearrange this, right? To be maybe it's a little bit easier to reason about, right? So if 
we know that these two values can only be 0 or 1. So let's think about this. If x of i is 0, what's the only legal value for x of j? Zero. It has to be 0, which is exactly what we want in that case, right? But if x of i is 1, then what can x of j be? Zero. It can be 0 or 1, right? So we can independently have i x of i exist, right? Separate from x of j. But we can only have x of j if we first had x of i. Does that make sense, what we're doing here? So this little construct right here forces us to first have x sub i before we allow x sub j to exist. Okay? We're going to use this in our final project when we talk about um, building up contiguous congressional districts. Okay? You can basically say that um, uh, if I'm only going to allow this, this county to be in Congressional District 1 if this one is in Congressional District 1 first. Okay? We'll talk about the details of why we do it that way. Um, I think it's already on the video if you, you've looked at it. But this is a big part of how we build our final project to make the Congressional Districts be contiguous. All right, our next one sounds similar. But it's uh, slightly different here. Co-requisite. All right? The difference between this one and this one is that we don't let I be independent. In other words, we want both of these together or neither of them together. They, they have to be, take the, the co part of it is it, like the same as cohabitating or collaborating, right? It's, it's the togetherness uh, part of it. And so we only want x of j and x of i or neither x of j and not x of i. How would you modify this equation to get that additional requirement? Yeah. Could you just make them equal? Yeah, yeah. Right? If we make them both equal, that's our requirement. And if we do the same sort of transformation, that's x of j minus x of i equals zero rather than less than or equal. <clears throat> the final type of constraint I want to discuss is mutual exclusion. Uh, and this might occur if you're trying to decide who you're going to choose as your vendor. These, these are going to be my vendor who supply our, I don't know, our hamburger. Or this is the vendor that supplies our steel. Or this is the, the vendor that we've got an exclusive contract with for labor, or whatever the case is. And so, in this case, you don't want to choose two vendors for whatever reason. Maybe you can negotiate an additional discount because of that exclusive exclusivity. And so you're, you're going to only do this or that. Right. <clears throat> Again, how might we build this constraint? Any idea? I thought your hand was up. Uh, Maybe? Would it be similar to the previous one, but like, x of j minus x of i is 1, or... Say it, yeah, I think you got it. The right hand would have to be 1. Yes. Uh, 
Um, but we're going to actually sum up. Yeah. Right? So, let's look at the four possible ways this can happen. What if they're both zero? Is that legal? It works. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We're not choosing both of them. Is zero plus zero less than one? Yeah, so that works for us. How about if they're both, we, we want to use both of them. They're both one. Is that legal? No. One plus one, is that less than one? No, so that matches. It's not legal and it doesn't fit this inequality. Let's say we choose J but not I. Is that legal? Okay, so that's going to be 1 plus 0. That matches our equation. And if we choose I but not J, should that be legal? Yes, 0 plus 1 also matches this. And hopefully you can see that this can extend to not just mutual exclusion between two parties, but you can have it one of, only one of these, these three or four, or however many people are part of this mutual exclusion uh, set. All right. Questions about these four types of constraints that we might encounter? So the, the first one, I'm sorry, the second one, sorry. The second one. So this one means? This means, um, let's say it says that, um, I'm trying to give a, a real life, life scenario, yeah. that you, um, let's say it will only let you, um, buy a good if you're already a member of the of that uh, company, right? So let's say um, you can't buy this unless you're part of Amazon Prime. Yeah. Okay. So the the this right here is are you a Prime member in Amazon Prime, right? Mm -hmm. And this is whether or not you can buy a specific item. Right. <clears throat> this, it, buying an item, is conditional on being a member of Prime first. Mm -hmm. But being a member of Prime is separate from buying this item. Okay. So, <clears throat> we, it, we say that we, can, we will only allow this to be true, being able to buy an item, if first we're a member of Amazon Prime. Okay. If this is zero, if that's false, mm -hmm. there's no way that you can buy that item, right? Because if this is zero, the only way you can maintain this inequality is to keep this at zero. Okay. Right? If this is one, that doesn't force this to be one, right? Just because I became a member of Amazon Prime doesn't force me to buy this, uh, this particular item. Right? It allows me to buy that item, or many other possible items. Right? So that, that's why it's one way dependent. I can, I can buy that item now that I'm a member of Prime, whereas I couldn't before. Yes? So for mutual exclusion, uh -huh. none of them None of them have to be true. None of them have to. If you wanted them to be, if you wanted them to be true, you would just eliminate the less than or equal. Right? And then one of them would have to be true. Right? Because now that basically becomes a k out of n where your k is 1. So normally we say mutual exclusive because we do want to allow for choosing them. Okay. 
and then for the third constraint, uh -huh. if we use the same um, example of Amazon Prime, uh -huh. so, so that means like, if you're on the prime item, I guess it's to be equal to. Yes, yes. Okay. So it's a bad use of that case because that's not how we think of Amazon Prime. Yeah. Right? In this case, you're saying that you have to have both. So, in this case, you're saying if you get your membership, you have to buy this item. Oh. And if you buy the item, you have to get the membership. It's more like if you sign up for like a um, club of the month, right? Give me the copy of the month. My membership does imply buying the, the product. And buying the product does imply being a member of that club. Okay, but these are types of constraints, so they yeah. don't work together. Right, right. They're they're, they're different. I mean, yeah, they they these yeah. are different types of scenarios. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah. If you want to um, have a a scenario for mutual exclusion, um, I like to to use dating as a, a scenario. Not too many people like to have you dating someone else while they, you're dating them, right? That's not usually seen as, as a positive behavior, right? They want mutual exclusion, understandably so, right? But you don't have to be dating anyone, right? You have that choice as well. All right. Okay. So let me set up. Uh, our problem here um, that we're going to work together to kind of figure out how these types of constraints apply to that particular problem, and then I'll let you solve it on your own for, for a moment for a moment. Okay, so for this, uh, imagine that we're going to be, I don't know, setting up a new retail space, which is kind of hard to think about in this time and age when most malls are going under and not people dying to go in them. But assume like malls are coming back and people want to go shopping again and it's a, an exciting time to be with other people for the first time in years, right? <laughs> I know, it sounds crazy. So, um, you're trying to decide what to put in your new retail space. All right? And you have um, $45,000 to invest, and the space that you've decided to rent out has um, 420 square feet. So this is more like a, a kiosk, or you know, a really tiny mall space. We're not talking like a uh, <coughs> anchor spot in in the mall. All right, um, and you've decided to be some sort of electronics retailer. Okay. And these are the different options that you're trying to figure out what you want to, to put in your store. So you've got seven different options available to you. So this is the um, electronic item. This is the investment for that particular item. This is the required floor space, and this is the expected ROI. Alright? So before I even list anything else, you should be able to guess what we're going to want to do for this scenario. What do we, what are we probably likely to want to do? Want to maximize our Yeah, we want to invest. maximize our return on our investment, right? Uh, but we've got these two columns as our constraints, right? We can't invest in everything, um, and we can't exceed the floor space that we, we have for our retail space. So, option number one are HDTVs. Um, and all these are in thousands. Uh, 
thousands of dollars. Um, all right. Oh, um, 4K TV. They're bigger, so they take up more space. Uh, um, they cost more money, and you're only going to have the top and bottom side. All right. I think this uh, example is getting old in the 2000 way. Like, people want to buy blue ray players anymore. <laughs> <laughs> PlayStation 5 that just came out, right? Yes. Why does a 4K TV take less floor space than a TV player? Uh, because you. <laughs> because it's artificial. <laughs> 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 we got lots of Blu-ray players. No one buys them. Yeah. Actually, I took a different problem and I rebranded the, the electronic items from, from what they were before because while this looks old, that problem was ancient. <laughs> Alright. So, this, if we just stop here, um, this would be the type of problem that um, you could have solved al already given the, the tools that we've already developed in class. Maximize your re return on investment um, with the constraint that you don't exceed your floor space and that you don't exceed your investment of $45,000. All right? Um, but we're going, we're going to make that a little bit easier. Um, now that we have um, our binary values that we're going to be doing here, um, we're just going to have a, um, a yes, well, hold on. Um, yes or no to, I don't know, I'll, I'll see if this is even legal. Right? This might be a configuration that we use. I don't know if it meets the constraints or not. Uh, no, it doesn't, right? My first two check marks were there. Right? <coughs> That's why we want to let the computer figure it out for us, right? Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to have um, a binary variable that indicates whether or not we decide to use that particular electronic item in our store. Because now it's really easy to compute uh, whether we have too much investment. How do we compute the investment that's required? Yeah. We do the sum product of all the binary column and then all the investment. So it adds the one and just add it together. Right, right. Uh, this is the awesome thing about binary multiplication. I know I said this on, um, on Wednesday for, for those of you who are here, right? But when you multiply a 1 times anything, you get that anything. You multiply a 0 times anything, you get a 0. So you don't even have to like engage your mind to be able to do 
that, um, and so it's really easy. You multiply this binary value times these, and then you can just sum up the, the products and get how much. And so we would do 1 times 20 plus 1 times 32 plus 0 plus 0 plus 1 times 15 plus 0 plus 1 times 2, and we would get something like um, $69,000. Dollars there, right? And you say, oh no, we violated our constraint. All right. So we can do that really quickly to figure out if we've got too much invested. Or we can apply the same sort of strategy towards whether or not we've used too much floor space or not. All right? Uh, but <clears throat> this is a practice problem specifically for these type of constraints. So let's throw some, some more constraints in here. So, um, we have these additional requirements for our retail space. One, we're only going to allow, we're only going to sell Blu-ray if we sell TVs first. Either HD TVs or more tape. We already know because of my little mistake here, we can't sell both of them. Yeah. So that's going to be the first constraint. Oh, well, let me talk about that before I get to the next requirement. What does that sound like? We're only going to allow Blu rays if we also sell TVs first. Which of those types of constraints? Are, are we doing? Yeah, it's conditional, right? Blu-ray is here. The seat, but wait a second here. This is a little different, right? Because this is one, but this isn't just one binary value, but it's two binary values, right? <clears throat> so we can't just say x of Blu-ray minus X of TV, because there isn't just one TV variable, right? There's two TV variables. So how are we going to modify this constraint to be conditional not just on one item, like we have here with Amazon Prime, but either HD TVs or 4K TVs? Yes. Would you just make two variables, one for HDTV and 4K TV, and then you have X sub Blu-ray minus both of those? Okay. Um, yes, but I need more information. To <laughs> you, can put, you can put them in parentheses and add them together, because even if you have both, it's still greater than zero. Okay. Yes. Very good, right? So if I don't care which one of these two I have, as long as I have one of them, it's going to make this value appear to be true and allow this to, to be false. And this is exactly the type of constraint we're going to be building in our final project. Because you're not going to say your county is dependent on just one county being in correctional district but it's dependent upon some of its neighbors being in that congressional district. Okay? So this is exactly the type of constraint that's going to appear over and over and over and over and over and over again in your final project. All right. Okay, requirement number two, if that we decided, I don't know, marketing has done a study and said that um, when you sell consoles, you're selling to one demographic, and when you're selling laptops, you're selling to another demographic, and it's a bad idea to try to mix those demographics in your store. You're, you're diluting your, your overall effect. So you have to decide which demographic you're going to go after, and you're not allowed, you, you've decided that you're not going to allow yourself to sell both consoles and laptops. 
So we're either consoles or laptops, but not both. All right. Which one of these types of constraints? Mutual exclusion. Mutual exclusion, right? We are not allowing both of these to take place. Okay. Requirement C. <coughs> yes. But in that case, would we do it equal to one? Uh, no, because we're not saying you have to sell. Okay, yeah. just, you don't want both. You don't want both. Okay. So for this one, we're saying that um, tablets require data plan. Okay? And so in order to sell tablets, we also have to sell the cell phone to be able to sell a data plan. Okay. What does that sound like here? Not quite. Why is it not a co-requisite? Because you, yeah. don't have, you don't have to uh, sell and have a sell a cell phone. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. We are allowing ourselves to sell cell phones without selling tablets. So it's not a co-requisite. It's a conditional or a prerequisite, right? Then our final requirement uh, is that we don't want to be so specialized in one area um, that we get kind of put into some niche. Um, so we're going to require at least three different product lines. All right? And do KL All right, I'm saying we have to have at least three out of the seven possible product lines. All right? Cool. I'll leave it here and let you work on this as part of your assignment for Monday. There are two other problems from your book that you also will work on for Monday. So on Monday, uh, I will answer any questions you have about those problems or the problems that were due for, for Wednesday, um, as well as going over any questions from the exam that you might have. So I'm going to start talking about our next topic so that I leave room on Monday for those kinds of questions. And will you upload this video? I will. Okay. Um, I'm doing the video both to make a final set of videos for all topics for all time, but also because there are some students that are starting to get quarantined in our class and I need to make it available to them. Yeah. <clears throat> Alright, I will do it as quickly as possible. It turns out that it's not a quick process to download it from the video camera and upload it to, to YouTube. Mm -hmm. So it'll show up sometime this weekend. Um, if I do it, <laughs> I want to do it before I leave for home. Because if I do it from home, it takes about... Yeah, the, the download speed is here. Yeah, the upload speed there. Upload, yeah. Yes. Uh, I have a very slow internet connection at home. Uh, like intolerable stuff. To the point where this summer, 
I came in here to work instead of working from home because I couldn't do things like Zoom. All right. So our next topic, we're going to jump ahead in the textbook. I think it's chapter 13. Um, we're going to do uh, quantitative rather than qualitative decision making. So we're going to try to talk about how do we make decisions that are data driven um, and have uh, numbers that back them up. The other thing we're going to talk about is that it's not a single number. We're going to talk about multiple decision making strategies. And we're going to talk about things like um, the optimistic scenario, the, the conservative scenario, the minimax scenario, the minimax regret. And the reason why we're going to be talking about all these different scenarios is because depending upon who the decision maker is, they might have different priorities that it are important to them. And so one of those decision making scenarios is going to more closely align with their, their values. Or you might not know, and so having different perspectives might allow you to be able to see that from a lot of different reasons, this particular decision is, seems like it's the best, but you should also know that this other way of thinking is, is, is valid. You need to understand all of these decision-making ideas, because in your final report for the final project, you're going to have to present a suggested recommendation using these decision making scenarios. So you're going to look at three different options for redistricting your state. Um, and you're going to say, based on those three options, we recommend that the state use this option because of these decision making strategies. Okay. So that's going to be part of the re report that you generate at the end of the class. So um, what I'm going to do to kind of drive this discussion, uh, no pun intended because it has to do with cars, uh, is um, to consider, um, you know, some, maybe it's a decision that, that some of you are going to encounter sooner uh, as, as when, you, when you graduate here, and that is uh, you've decided that um, you're, you need a vehicle and you're going to go for a lease. Let's disregard whether that's a smart or um, not so smart idea. You've decided to lease a vehicle um, and you've got options available to you. Uh, so, um, lease option We're going to go for A, B, and C to be very generic. Um, and So the way that these leases work is that you pay some monthly uh, rent for that vehicle. And as long as you do not exceed your mileage allowance, then that's all you have to pay. But if you go above that level of mileage, then you have to pay an additional fee per mile that goes above this amount right here. Uh, usually, Leases are three years, um, and so um, we can compute the, the cost from that. So we're going to order them by their monthly lease amount. And as you might expect, the more you pay per month, the larger your mileage allowance uh, is. So 
before I go any further, do these parameters make sense for our three lease options? Okay. Yes. Um, is the uh, is monthly cost before the surcharge per mile, or does that include the surcharge per mile? That's this is a fixed monthly That's cost. That's a fixed rate, and, and then this is variable depending upon whether or not you exceed these these mileages. Okay. All right. So based on some research, um, you learned that um, you the last three three years you've driven your car. You've driven. Uh, 15,000, 12,000, and 18,000 miles. And you expect to use your car about the same way for the next three years as you did for the past three years. Okay? <coughs> so, what we can do is we can compute what each one of these lease, leases would cost if we average each one of these mileages over the next three years. Okay, so we're going to do the total cost, so we'll do a lease for the low mileage. Pre-computed these, so you don't have to type these into a calculator or anything. You can see for a low mileage scenario, 12,000 miles over three years that would be the 36 k So we would just pay the $299 a month times three years, and that would be our $12,764. Um, but if we did our medium mileage, we would go 45,000 miles. So we would have to pay this 10764 plus we would have to pay an additional 9,000 miles times 15 cents. And that's where we would get this 12,114. And similarly, we would pay an even larger surcharge if we drove the whole 54,000 miles, which is 18,000 times 50. All right. This is. So you can see that lease B, we don't get, have to pay anything extra for the low mileage or the medium mileage because they both fall under the 45,000 miles. And lease C, we all pay the same because we're never exceeding our mileage allowance right now. All right. Does that make sense? Okay, so the question we're going to continue on on Monday is how do we analyze since we don't know for sure which of these three scenarios we're going to encounter, which of these three leases we would recommend taking based on these different decision-making scenarios. Okay? And different decision-making scenarios are actually going to choose different lease options. All right? Have a great weekend, everyone. I'll see you then.